so we are already live we're talking first of all about <coughs> solutions to homework and then we will continue talking about test of hypothesis so here say it's called test can everybody see that all right in problem number one we needed to assume that we have a gamma distribution with parameters one and theta, and technically that is exponential distribution and equals 20, 20 observations and you needed to draw a frequency and then draw the histogram. So for each of the histogram, you just go to the interval and then you draw a bar with height equal to the number of, the, of observations that are in the interval. Then B of the question, and then it asks, does this seem credible? This seems to be going down quickly as an exponential function. So it seems that the claim is credible. Then the question goes, get the MLE, how to find the MLE, you, you write down the likelihood function. <clears throat> the likelihood function is the product of the, the values of the PDF for all the observations. When you're multiplying the PDF is one over theta e to negative x over theta. And for each of the xi's, when you're multiplying, you have one over theta n times and the product of exponentials becomes exponential sum of the xi sum negative one over theta. So that's the likelihood function. And then you take log likelihood function because we always work with the log likelihood function. It's easier to handle. When you take the log of this function, it becomes negative n natural log of theta minus one over theta sum of xi. So that's the log likelihood function. And this is the function that you want to see if it has a maximum or not. Two things have to be done here. You need to take the derivative first, set it equal to zero, solve, and then you do the second derivative test, which consists of taking the second derivative, plugging in the value of the critical points and checking that that second derivative is negative, not positive. So you do that here. When you solve, you find that theta hat is x bar. Second derivative gives you this. And when you plug in the estimator, you get that, which is negative n over x bar cubed, and it's positive numbers, so it's always positive. So uh, this is x bar cubed or x bar squared? Squared. Because you have cubed here, so it's squared. So this is a negative number. Therefore, you have a maximum at that point. And the, the way to remember this is always think of the second derivative as the second derivative test as looking at the parabola. When your parabola looks up, you have a minimum, right? And the second derivative is negative. It, sorry, the second derivative is positive. When it looks up, the second derivative is positive. You have a minimum. When it looks down, the second derivative is negative, and you have a maximum. So if you forget, that's how you can remember it. Okay? Because your parabola is either a x squared with a positive or a x squared with a negative, right? The second derivative in any case is 2a. When a is negative, the limit is negative infinity. So it looks down and there is a maximum. When a is positive, the limit at infinity is plus infinity. It looks up and there is a minimum. So whenever you're doing the second derivative test, think of that. Now, so that's, and, and that's important because sometimes you can check, you can solve this equation and find any solutions. Which one is going to be the correct one? 
right? Not all uh, critical points have to give a maximum. Some of them give a maximum, some give a minimum, and some give an inflection point, right? And so here, because that is all true, we can conclude that we have a maximum at theta hat equals x bar, and therefore x bar is the MLE. It's the same routine that will come back in any of the problems of this kind. Right? You do solve that and then check. Then part C, the question was, the sample median, find the sample median, and this is done in 375, right? The basic, the basic statistics course. When you have an even number of observations, the sample median is the average of the middle observation. When you have an odd number of observations, the median is the one that is in the middle. Of course, when you sort them, right? From the smallest to the largest. So in this case, we have an even number of observations, 20. So the two numbers that are in the middle are 10 and 11. So you look at the 10 at the 11 largest numbers and you add them to divide by two to get the median. If it was a not number, then let's say 21, then there is one number that is at the center that's whose observation ranked 11, right? So that observation would be the median. So in this case, this is what we get as median. And for the distribution that we have gamma of one, Theta, you can solve that. The CDF of this function, it, it, of this distribution, will be one minus e to negative x over theta for x positive. And therefore, you want the median. You set that CDF equal to one half, and you solve for x for the CDF to be equal to one half because the median of a population is defined as the point where the CDF is equal to one half for a continuous distribution. So we find the CDF. If you don't know it, you write down the density and you integrate to find it. Then you solve this, you find out that X is equal to theta times natural log of two. So this is the population median, which is estimated by 55.5. So the median is estimated as 55.5, and the true value is theta natural log of 2. And the last part of the question was based on the MLE, get another estimate of the median. Based on the MLE, we have the MLE is theta hat and mu, which is the median in this case, is equal to theta times natural log of two. So I just replace theta by theta hat to get the, another estimate of the median that is based on the MLE. That's how you find the estimate of based on the MLE, which means just get into that formula and replace the parameter by the estimate of, of theta, which is in that case the MLE. And when you do that, you can see you get 70 point, you get 70.11, which is a lot larger than this, right? Any questions on this problem? Why is this square root? Is that a fixed formula? Sorry, it's natural log of two. It's one here. Yes, natural log of two is a mistake that I corrected earlier. Other questions on this specific problem? What is not clear on the met on, on, on the the method that is used here or the, the assumptions that we have? Any questions on that? This is the time to understand. Midnight before the test, you'll not be able to just look at that and understand. So everybody is okay with this. 
All right. Uh, we will talk about that actually. So we need to fix the date for that. Now, problem, the next problem, by by formulation seems a bit tricky, but when you look carefully at it, you see that it's simple. There is no expected value in that question. All you need to do is just compute the integral. And in order to compute the integral, you need to understand what this definition of the function means. What does it mean actually? If you look carefully, you will see that this value of the function here does not depend on little x. So it is a function of little x, but on every interval, it doesn't depend on x. So it is a constant on every single interval, i equal one through m. The function is constant. What is the constant here? The number of xi's that are in that interval. So on each of the intervals, the function is constant equal to the number of observations that fall into that given interval out of the n observations. But there are m intervals. So I just denote that number. Let that mi be the number of observations that fall within these two numbers. So we have the sum of all those numbers is equal to the total number of observations because we are not creating observations, right? We have n observations. And if we add the number of observations that fall in each of the intervals, we get the total number of observations. Why? Because the intervals don't intersect. These intervals don't intersect. They are next to each other and cover the whole spectrum. Am I making sense? So if we add all the observations in each of them, we get the total number of observations. Everybody agrees with it. All right. Then I write f hat as 1 over 2nh sum, which is uh, 1 over 2nh. I'm missing something here. 2h times n, right? Yeah we have over two HN. So one over two HN is the one that is here. And this number of observations, I'm writing it as sum I from one through M of what? MI, which is the number of observations that is there for that specific interval times the indicator function of that specific interval. Am I making sense? So if, meaning what? If, uh, if little x is in this interval, count all the observations that fall in that interval. This is what it means. And then add them all, right? And technically, Writing it this formula this way, it's a bit funny because this sum for every given x consists of only one term, which is the one on top here. Because x is only in one interval. X cannot be in, in many intervals at the same time. Am I making sense? Does this make sense? So x is in one specific interval. Every single given x cannot be in two different intervals at the same time. So this sum here is the same thing that is written here. But why do I do it like this? Because for me, it would be simple to integrate. Now, I don't have to go and look for where is x, where is that x. I say the integral of f of x, f hat of x is and I just use that formula, one over two nh sum, and then the mi comes out on each of the intervals, the mi comes out and I integrate the indicator function from negative infinity to infinity dx. But this indicator function 
is non-zero only on one interval, the only interval where x is. Are we in agreement? And that interval is an interval of length 2h. So the integral of one, this, this function is equal to one, the integral of one over an interval of length 2h is equal to 2h, right? So that is why this integral here is equal to that equal to 2h. Therefore, the answer would be 1 over 2hn sum stands for the sum that was there. 2h for the integral times the mi. Now 2h comes out cancels with this one and the sum of mi is equal to n. It cancels with the n and you get 1. But if you don't, if you don't write the function like this, as in the other, if you remember the other formulations of, of the estimator that we have for continuous data, this is exactly how we write that, right? If, if, if you don't do it this way, then you might have a hard time trying to figure how to integrate. Splitting and think, oh, if X is there, if X is not there, and then you have a large work that is coming. And if you just remember our usual notation for f hat, you write that down, then the answer goes smoothly. Any question on this one? This is an important problem because you need to understand that when you're using something to estimate a density, then that thing better be a density, which means the integral better be one. Otherwise, you're using a quantity to estimate a density, and that quantity is, doesn't have the property of a density, because the properties of the density are one, positive, two, Integral equal to one. Positive is obvious because it's a number divided by two in nh, and you need to check that it, 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 the integral is equal to two. Questions? Every given x can only be in one interval. It cannot be in two at the same time. Because the intervals don't intersect. Those intervals are you have a, b, and then you have the first interval there. Then you have the second starting there. Then you have the third starting there right here, and you have the, the last one here. There's no intersection. So if I pick x, wherever I pick x on this interval, it's going to be inside only one interval. It cannot be here and there at the same time. So your value of x when you're integrating you've got to know that it's only one of the intervals that is going to be accounted for from negative, whether you're integrating from negative infinity to infinity or not, only one of them is going to account for, for that specific function i i that is given there. Because it's non-zero only on that specific interval, right? And the integral itself is equal to two i because you're integrating one to 2h, you're integrating 1, and the length of the interval is h. If you say integral from a minus h to a plus h dx times 2h, okay. no matter what a is.
That's what you have in this question. Other questions? Are we good? All right, next problem. That was 4.27. And uh, in this problem, we say that we have X bar is the mean of a random sample, usually I just put RS, from the normal distribution with mean mu and variance nine. Find n such that probability that x bar minus one less than mu less than x bar plus one is equal to 0 0.9. What's the question about? It's about knowing the properties of the normal distribution. X bar for observations from the normal distributions follows a normal distribution. X bar follows a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared over n. And then you use that to find what this probability is equal to. How? Get the z value. <coughs> if you subtract mu here, uh, if you subtract six, uh, x bar on both sides, it goes to the middle. And then you multiply by minus one the whole thing, you still have minus one less than x bar minus mu less than one. And then you can multiply by root n over sigma to get the central limit theorem form thing, which in this case doesn't need the central limit theorem because it does follow the normal distribution. So if, if I take the absolute value of this because of negative one, one, it's gonna be less than root n over sigma. I just multiply the whole thing by root n over sigma and take the absolute value less than that, equal 0.9. And this thing here is Z. So this is probability that absolute value of Z is less than root N over sigma. And then from here, I use one property that we know that Z squared Follow high square with one degree of freedom. When you take z and you square it, when you take the standard normal distribution and you square it, you obtain the random variable that follows high square with one degree of freedom. We had this already in this course, right? So if I don't want to use the z table, I could use the z table to answer the question here, but I don't want to. So I square the whole thing. Because I have absolute value, I can square it. I don't change anything because of the absolute value. So I square it, I get z squared less than n over sigma squared. And now I know that z squared is high squared with one degree of freedom. I just go to my high square table and I look for 0.9, and that is 2.706. So I solve for n, sigma squared is nine, I get n equals this. And you need to remember to always round up. If you're rounding down, you're not getting enough. So the value of n turns out to be almost 24. So that's how many observations you will need. To make sure that this probability is 0.9. Questions? Any questions? Huh? 25. 0.5. So how much you get when you multiply it or use it? 24. Point. point something. If it's 24 point something, then you round to 25. You always round up, as I say. Even if it's 0 0.01, 0 0.01, you gotta round up. Because if you round down, then you don't have enough to cover that interval. So you need at least, he says. 
So you need to have have it up. All right, if no question on this, look at the next one. That one is the kind of problem that you can easily see on a test. Because your test is not about adding, adding numbers and computing Z or T scores. It's about understanding the underlying theory that is there. So you need to be able to solve questions like this. You can apply statistics scores and yeah, then you can go run the numbers on the computer and find the answer. But in this one, no. So this problem is about predicting the next value. This is why they are going up to n plus one. So if you have, if you are generating randomly numbers from a distribution and you already have n numbers, can you predict the next number? That's the question. So how best can you predict the next number? If you know, for example, that they are coming from the standard normal distribution and you already have n observation, based on what you know, can you predict it? That question sounds strange because we know that we are taking a random sample, so observations are independent, right? So knowing some of them does not affect the, uh, the one that is coming up, right? But still, the statistical question stands. If I know that I have already these observations, what can I say about the next one? And this question says, okay, here, first part, find C such that C times X bar minus X N plus one, which is the next observations after the N observations that you got, divided by S has a T distribution. Now the answer is based on the definition of the T distribution. What is the T distribution? A T distribution is a distribution of the random variable T equals W over square root of V divided by R, where W is the standard normal random variable, and V has a high square distribution with R degrees of freedom, R being the one that is divided by here. And moreover, V and W have to be independent. So this means V and W are independent. Is notation. So what this is saying is technically telling you, you need to show that you can form a standard normal distribution from this one, form a high square distribution from this one, and make sure that this and that are independent, All right? and then write this formula to get a T and identify your C from that. That's how it goes. And each of the steps is important. First, get a central, uh, get a standard normal from the top. Make sure you square this guy and find out what is the degree of freedom if it is a high square, and then show that the two things are independent and then figure out what should be that coefficient. So that's what we do. First part, we need to show that X bar minus X N plus one is independent of S. Why is it true? I say it is true because X bar is independent of X. That's one of the problems that we had earlier in this book. It's a theorem. X bar and S are always independent when you have the normal distribution underlying. And xn plus one is independent of all the observations that are given before x1 all to xn because it's a random sample. So therefore, if x1 is xn plus one is independent of all this, and this function of x1 to xn is independent of x, then x bar minus xn plus one is independent of x. That's the first part. Now S squared is one over N minus one sum of X I minus X bar squared. And we know that N minus one S squared over Sigma squared follows the high square distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom when 
the Xi's are normally distributed. So this is high square, and that's what we needed, high square divided by its degree of freedom, okay. And moreover, X bar is normal, Xn plus one is normal, the two are independent, so the distribution of this difference is also normal, and the mean is going to be zero because X bar has the same mean as Xn plus one, so the mean is zero. And the variance is the sum of the variances of these two. The variance of X bar is sigma square over N. The variance of Xn plus one is sigma square. So that's what the distribution of X bar minus Xn plus one is. And to obtain a Z, to obtain Z from this, what we need to do is divide by the square root of this. Are we good till now? When you have a normal distribution, it would mean zero to obtain Z from it, you divide by the standard deviation whose square you have inside here. Now, from here, that's what I was saying. From here, you get the normal zero one by dividing this thing by the square root of what was inside here which is sigma over square root of n plus one divided by n. So we got the standard normal. We got the standard normal divided by square root of our high square. We already showed that this is a high square divided by its degree of freedom by definition of the, the t. This should be t with n minus one degree of freedom because we have standard normal divided by high square, the square root of high square divided by its degree of freedom. And the degree of freedom that is here is supposed to be the degree of freedom of T. And we already showed that these two variables are independent. What I'm saying is right here, the definition of, the definition of T, that's standard normal divided by square root of high square divided by the degree of freedom of the high square. So that's what we just did here. Now that square root takes care of sigma square, sigma square comes out, becomes sigma, the sigmas cancel, n minus one cancels with this n minus one, and you're remaining here with square root of n over n plus one, which is here, times x bar minus xn plus one over s follows a t. So right away, you got the value of c that you were looking for. So c is equal to square root of n over n plus one. Questions? There's a lot of games with distributions and their properties in all, the, all these problems. Now, if you look at the answer in the book, this is not what you will find. Why? Because from one edition of the book to another, they modify the problem and they forgot to modify the answer. We have n minus one over n because the original problem was x1 all the way up to xn minus one and then xn. So there is one observation less for the answer they have here. Okay. So don't always try to get the answer that is about the book. Sometimes it's wrong. Now, next question here inside there is they give you n equal eight and asked to find k such that the probability that x bar minus k times s is less than x nine, less than x bar plus k times x equal 0.8. So technically, without telling you, this is actually building a confidence interval for x nine. Okay. 
So without knowing X9, we can predict that with 80% chance, the ninth observation is going to be between these two numbers for a given K that we are going to find here. How do we find that K? Based on the fact that we already know that this random variable here is T, that's what we want to do here. We want to recreate this variable here to get our answer. And so we try by sending X bar, in, X bar inside here, that becomes negative K X bar, negative K less than X nine minus X bar over S less than K, send X bar in divided by S. And then you multiply that by minus, it doesn't change anything. You can see the interval is symmetric when you multiply by negative sign, you see some the same place. Negative K less than X bar minus X nine over S less than K. And now what is missing here to get the T is square root of N over N plus one. So we multiply the whole thing by square root of N over N plus one. N is eight, so square root of eight, nine. And in the middle now, you will have that T with seven degrees of freedom because N is eight, less than K square root of eight over nine equals 0.8. Now this is a symmetric interval. You can use symmetry to find what this probability is equal to two. That probability is equal to two times the probability that T is less than the top one minus one because it's symmetric and the t distribution is also symmetric okay. how do i get this you ask right because it is the value here minus the value here but the value here is one minus the value there so it gives you twice minus one you are solving that equal 0.8 and so you solve when you find that equal 0.9. So you get this, and then you find your value of K. So the K is approximately 1.5. If you put that 1.5 there, then you got a, an 80% confidence interval for S9 based on the history of the experiment. Questions? Do I still have everybody online there? Okay. Is there any questions for this question? Oh, too many questions. <laughs> All right. Everybody okay? I see someone just to start. All right, so next. The next problem is about a binomial, which is repetition of the Bernoulli variable. And here, the question is about the length, the, the maximal length of an interval. And it's also a, a big question here, because we need to know that for proportions, for example, P times one minus P is always, less than one fourth. Why? Just because this is a, it's a parabola. It's a parabola that has a maximum one fourth at P equal one half, okay? And they even give that hint in the problem here. They, they didn't have to. So your parabola is this, P times one minus P, that's P minus P squared. If you want to draw this parabola, you will see that goes like this and the, the top here is one four. So anyways, the length of the confidence interval is two times Z alpha over two square root of P hat times one minus P hat over N. If you remember the confidence intervals we wrote down last time, the difference between the two end points of the confidence interval, that's what you call the length, 
right? The, rent, the length of an interval AB is B minus A. So the length of the confidence interval, when you subtract those two endpoints, what you always get is 2Z alpha over 2 square root of P hat times 1 minus P hat over N. And now this P hat times 1 minus P hat is what is always, what I just wrote on board here, it's always less than 1 fourth no matter what p hat is. So if we are to use that, we need therefore to know that two, and here alpha is, uh, I'm using alpha equal 0 0.05, okay. So alpha over two is 0 0.025. 2z.025 square root of p hat minus times 1 minus p hat over n is less than or equal to 2z and then you replace that whole thing by 1 fourth this is 1 half times 1 minus 1 half is 1 fourth so that length is always going to be less than this which is equal to what square root of one fourth comes out here, cancels the two, so you get z over root n, okay? And so the length of the confidence interval is always less than this thing for proportions. And I want it to be at most 0.02, so this thing better be less than 0.02, and therefore I solve for n and then I get this. And again, you round up when you end. The smallest n has to be at least this. Questions? Are we still together? All right, so that's it for this guy. And uh, oh, let me just talk about this. So the next problem was about building a confidence interval. And this problem states that the variances are equal. When the variances are equal, you use the full sample, SP, to estimate the variance. So that is N. 1 minus 1 s1 squared plus n2 minus 1 s2 squared over n1 plus n2 minus 2. In that problem, they actually said, hey, look at that for formula number this to do that. But on a test, I'm not going to say look at formula number this to do that. So you need to know that when the variances are equal, this is the formula that you use. And when you use that formula, the interval is x bar minus y bar minus t with alpha over 2 and then n1 plus n2 minus 2 times sp which is the square root of the number you get from here times square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2 then you do the same thing in there with the difference of plus and then you go find T.025 with 57 degrees of freedom, you can find that up. You get this 2.002. 2 and then you plug that in there, you compute.
I think that was in a lecture on Wednesday last week. Doing it at home, there is Google. And, and, and on Google, you have many tables of Z, not even table, but calculators in which you can just put the number, put the degree of freedom to find the probability. Usually we say, hey, if it's large, if it's a too large number, then round it to round it to the Z value that is that is given there. And then, then that's not what the problem is. So rounding, this is not too far from the number you would get if you're rounding with the Z value. The Z value is 1.96. The most important problem is here. Having the appropriate formula. Other questions? So that's right. Huh? We do we do accept that, but has to be the right formula first before you do that. Next. In the next problem, we had IID observations from normal with mean mu sigma squared. And it reminds you that n minus one over sigma squared s squared follows chi squared distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom for some a and b positive numbers. We want to rewrite this probability. So rewriting is simple, just divide, multiply, and then you get that first part. Then you do b, it gave you n equal nine, s squared, finding 95% confidence interval for sigma squared, which is technically that. So you got to find, you got to find B, you got to find A. How do you find B and A? You first start by A, uh, sorry, you first start by B. And you want B to satisfy that. And so you find the number that corresponds to that in the, in the high squared table. Then you want to find A by having that the probability that high squared is less than A is 0 0.025. Why? Because the probability of falling between A and B is 0.95. And the probability of falling below B is 0.975. That's what is given in the problem. Therefore, to fall below A, you need 0 0.025, right? And so you want to find the A that corresponds to this. Why do I use chi square? Because this thing that is written inside here, it says it follows chi square with n minus one degrees of freedom. So we go to the chi square table and we figure out what's the A that corresponds to 0.025 and that's it. And now your confidence interval for sigma square, this is it here, given here. It's n minus 1 over b times s squared to n minus 1 times s squared over a. So that's it. Now the last part of the question is asking you, what would you change in this problem if mu was known? I constantly repeat for this class is we don't estimate something that we know. 
if mu is known, we are not estimating mu. So we are going to build a different chi square, one over sigma squared sum i from one through n x i minus mu. Mu is known, it's a number. Square follows chi square with n degrees of freedom because they are independent, independent normal random variables. The square of each of them is a high square. The sum of them is a high square with n degrees of freedom. So this is what I would use to give a confidence interval for uh, sigma square in this case. Following the setup of the question, I would look for the probability that this thing is less than B being 0.975 and the probability of it being between A and B to be 0.95. And therefore I would construct my confidence interval based on the A and B that I find here, the way we did up there. That's basically what the question was asking you about. You can't use S in this question because mu is known. Questions? Are we still all together, Laurie? Okay. All right. Then we have the last question. Again, the question says the two random variables have the same variance. And when they have the same variance, you must use S P squared, which is N minus one, S one squared plus N minus uh, one, S two squared, divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2. And in this case, n1 equal n2 equal 10. So that's just one half s1 squared plus s2 squared, which gives you this. Then you go to your table and you look for t, 0 0.975, 0.025 with 18 degrees of freedom, which is 20 minus two. And you find that number. And then you have X bar one minus X bar two minus the T value times the square root of SP squared times square root of one over n1 plus one over n2, and then we repeat the same thing on the, on the other side. Questions? Yeah. All right, so that's it for the homework. Is there any question on this topic? Because we are moving away from it and we'll be doing something completely and different now, but still related to it. 
we'll be talking about testing hypothesis. Four point five. So we still have that same old problem that we have a population S X with this distribution function f of x theta that is known up to a parameter theta and now on top of that we want to say something about theta so we believe that theta belong to a set omega zero and we have a random sample of size n and we need to test the hypothesis or the claim that theta belongs to omega zero versus the alternative theta belongs to omega one, <coughs> where omega zero union omega one forms the entire set of values of theta that are possible. So all possible values of theta are in omega, they are either in omega zero or in omega one. Um, the question now is, based on the data that we have, what would we believe? What would we rather believe? That theta is in omega naught or that theta is in omega one? So H naught in this case is called the null hypothesis and H1 is called the alternative hypothesis. Again, we have a population X with distribution little f of X theta. The parameter theta is believed to belong to omega naught and we have a random sample x1 all the way up to xn of size n from this population and we need to test whether theta belongs to omega naught or belongs to omega one where omega naught union omega one forms the set of all possible values of theta our null hypothesis is what h1 is and the h what H0 is and H1 is called the alternative hypothesis. Dr. Longla, um, kind of in the middle of the screen on the left, I'm, I'm sorry, on the right, where we have um, omega naught union, omega sub one equals, what does okay. that say? equals omega. Okay, thank you. Now, we denote D, the space of all 
possible values of x1 up to xn. And we want to use a subset of that space to decide whether we would rather believe H0 or H1. So a test is based on the subset C. So we choose a subset C of D, which is called a critical region. based on which we want to decide whether we would rather believe H0 or H1. How do we choose C? It goes from one problem to another depending on the statistics that we have there. So if you are given a critical region, you need to know that you would, the rule would ask you to reject H0 if the, uh, the sample that you got is in the critical region. And reject H1 if you are in the complement, which means you're not in the critical region. And usually people do put, and even in this book, it's also written, reject H0 or in parentheses, accept H1, reject H1 or in parentheses, accept H1. But I always argue that we need, we always tend to reject in statistics because we are often not the, we are often not the authors of the claim, okay? When you are accepting somebody's claim, it's not sort of thinking like you're making it yours. You claim you did the study, you either rejected that with enough evidence or you couldn't reject it with that because you didn't have enough evidence to reject it. And that's how I always phrase, phrase it in my own work. I'll say, not enough evidence to reject H0. I didn't accept it. I didn't have enough evidence to reject it. When I reject, I said, I reject, and I know I might be wrong 5% of the time or 2% of the time, but I don't accept it. It's up to you. I don't have enough evidence to reject it. Keep your claim. Maybe somebody else will do something else, figure that it's not true. What did you call C and C? This, this belongs to, and that's the complement. No, 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 belongs to what though? What is that? C. C. It's just C? Yes. Okay. The same set C we have here that we are using for decision, which is a subset of D, which is the space of all vectors x1 up to xn. And so that's the rule. So basically from now on, what we'll be trying to do would be finding a C for each of the problems that we get and formulating a rejection criteria and applying it to a specific data set that is given. Then saying, what are the chances that our decision is correct? What are the chances that our decision is wrong? Yeah. Now, next is a problem. You, you, you could guess from what I wrote that there is a problem in all that, right? Because you get a reject, you, you get a, a critical region and you want to use it to reject but you don't know what the reality is, right? H0 might be true, H0 might be wrong. You're not going to know exactly that that C1 is going to give you exactly the region that is necessary to make sure that you reject. So you're always facing four options. 
when you when you when you get a C and you want to build a decision rule, you always face four possible cases, which are here in this table. The true state of the nature, which is what is not known, you don't know whether H naught is true or not. These are the two options that you don't know. And you want to decide whether to reject or not something that you don't know, right? So your decision might be to reject H naught and your decision might be to reject H1. Either way, when you reject H naught, you have a chance to be wrong when H naught is actually true and you rejected it. And you have a chance to be correct when you actually rejected it and the true and the truth was that H1 was true. So in this first case, we say that you made a type one error of rejecting something that is true. And here you are making a correct decision because you rejected H naught and in fact, H1 was true. So you did not reject H1 and it is true. So your decision was correct. Or in the second time, you could reject H1 while H naught is true. And therefore you made the correct decision, but you don't know, right? Or you reject H1 and then H1 in fact is true and you reject it. So here you rejected something that was true. And you couldn't therefore reject H naught, right? So if you couldn't reject H naught and H naught was false and you could not reject it, that's what we call the type two error. It's all based on H naught. So in this case, you couldn't reject H naught but H naught is false. So you could not reject something that was false. We call that a type two error here. You rejected something that was correct. And here you couldn't reject something that was correct. You couldn't reject something that was not correct. So there are always these four cases. Now this here, this part here, is what we have been talking about in this class. Your chance to be wrong. There is always a chance to be wrong, right? Alpha. And what is related to this guy here is what we call the power one minus the probability of being here is the power why would we call that a power because when it's large it's better you don't want to reject you you don't want to not be able to reject something that is not correct often So if it's not correct, you want to be able to reject it, right? So we say that the critical region is of size alpha. 
if alpha is equal to the maximum over theta in omega naught of the probability that x1 up to xn belongs to the critical region. And when omega naught contains only one element, this is just, there's no mass, it's just that probability. The probability to be in a critical region is equal to alpha. Which is that I told you is type one error, right? You reject H naught when you are in the critical region. So this probability is the probability of that error. Any questions? Right, so I guess we will stop here today and we will talk about examples next time. Dr. Longla, did you mention something when we were going over the homework about the test date? Yes, yes, yes. We need to decide. Thank you for reminding that. So we need to decide when, whether we will have that test before Thanksgiving or after. 